Meryl, you're muted. Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to see everyone signing in in the chat and seeing where everyone is, is signing in from. My name is Meryl Como. I'm a member of the Events Committee of the Surface Design Association, which is a membership nonprofit focused on contemporary fiber and textile art. I'm delighted to welcome you to this week's textile talk, which is Meek Young Lee, Threading Memories and Weaving Connections. Textile talks and webinars are brought to you by the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. Before we begin today, we have some exciting programming on the horizon at SDA. In just a few weeks, the SDA is hosting its 2024 online con conference titled Parallel Play which will explore the intersection of individual artistic vision and group creativity. Join fellow makers in exploring how cross-disciplinary interactions, interpretations, and discoveries generate new ways of thinking. This year's featured speakers include the legendary costume designer and two-time Academy Award winner, Ruth E. Carter, and internationally acclaimed artist, Nene Okore as well as more than 15 hours of programming throughout the week. February also kicks off the SDA's 2024 online workshop series, from basketry to natural pigments, recycled materials to the latest technologies. Our workshops offer the opportunity to learn new skills and techniques, get inspired, and find ways to apply what you learn to your current studio practice. You can check out our recorded recent textile talk featuring this year's workshops to get a taste of what is in store. We have added links in the chat to both the conference and workshops, and we're offering the textile talk artist a 10% registration discount with the code, the promo code of textile talk, all caps, textile talk. Now we have a few housekeeping announcements. This is a webinar, so your screens and mics are not active or showing. We welcome questions, which we will answer at the end of the artist presentation. Please submit them in the Q&A box at, located at the bottom of your screen. We're honored to bring you free and inspiring Textile Talks programming, and we respectfully ask that you be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and other participants Remember, your chat can be seen by everybody. Please use the Q&A for your questions, the chat box for greeting others, and the survey for commentary or ways that we can improve. If you prefer not to see the notifications from chat, you can click on the chat button and toggle them on or off. So today, our presenter is Meek Young Lee. She uses repetitive mark making to explore the relationships between tool and material, material and process, and image and context. In Meek Young Lee, Threading Memories and Weaving Connections, we'll hear directly from the artist as she introduces her recent solo exhibition, exploring memories from her childhood in Korea and later chapters of her life in the United States. The exhibition, Threading Memories, was just on view at the Princeton Art Museum and includes a reflection of the past 15 years of Meek Young's work as she makes space, holds, and reflects on memories and connections. Lee will also share information regarding international fiber and textile art organizations and communities that she has collaborated and participated with over the past decades that prove that provide a context and resonance to her growth and connections as an artist and an educator. Meek Young Lee is director of the School of Art, Design and Art History, College of Visual and Performing Arts at James Madison University. She lives and works in Harrisonburg and Philadelphia. Lee has had 18 solo exhibitions and a number of national and international lectures, exhibits, curatorial and collaborative projects. Lee was an editor 
for Art Textile of the World, Korea, Volume 1, and Lee received a fellowship from the Center for Emerging Artists in Philadelphia. And finally, Lee serves on SDA's Board of Directors, helping to guide the organization and cultivate international connections. So welcome, Mi Kyung. And now you may share your screen. Thank you, Meru. Thank you so much for joining this lecture. I'm honored to be here. As Amira introduced, before I came to JMU, um, I actually um, taught fibers and textile at the University of the Arts for 19 years. It influenced so much to my past 15 years of my body of work. I'm not going to talk about the details, but um, I taught fundamental textile processes and advanced fibers. And it was such a rewarding uh, experience to watch students' growth through material and process and problem solving driven. And also really kind of find the students, uh, their voice through making, through this beautiful medium. So these are some examples of uh, the students' work here. Lots of crayons and repetitive process of you know, understanding material, bring their um, stories of childhood. Mi Kyung, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're not seeing your screen yet. Oh. See if you could come back to the Zoom and sh uh, hit the share screen button. Sorry, I think we have a technical issue because of the screen's already shared. See if you go ahead and hit um, escape to exit out of the um, PowerPoint and then come back to the Zoom window, you should be able to reshare. Can go ahead and share on my end. And if you can just tell me next slide when you're ready um, for me to change the slides. Sorry about that. Um, I'm gonna have the, so should he, do you think that you can maybe um, show the screen, Lucy? Yes, I, I have it up now. Um, so, we can start on the slide with James Madison University, or would you like me to advance one further? Yeah, advance one further, please. Okay, so here we have um, the students and uh, the teaching. Mm -hmm. And then we can move forward. So this is a, a James Madison University. And you can advance to next, please. So already, I think I was talking about the teaching. So this is a student bodies from um, University of the Arts and we can advance a couple of slides. Thank you. So these are lots of uh, uh, students exploration with the materials and uh, material process and lots of crayons in this particular student's work. Next, please. And you can probably continue to go through the slides. So teaching really inspires me to engage and to collaborate with the, you know, with the others. And I think it is teaching really supported in a way to uh, reach out to what options, what opportunities that I could expand in my curriculum and that was uh, uh, how I really got to the point of, uh, you know, engagements and collaborations. So we can advance more slides. And this is actually, uh, we started with the dye lab with a um, collaboration with the local, you know, local schools. And I started really having a problem, uh, issues with the, um, the chemical dye. And we started having a uh, really, um, natural dye from 2020, 2003, and we've been engaging with the local communities. And we can advance next slides, please. <clears throat> so 
So since it's a really urban campus, we reach out to local communities who have uh, gardens. And so this is a collaboration with the fifth graders in Frankfurt Friends School. And uh, we're having harvest at the beginning of the semester, uh, working on the projects for the dye project. We can go next. And so really kind of uh, having this accumulation of understanding what actually uh, materials and you know, uh, ingredients are coming from, working with the, the small children and our students to be able to also uh, teach them and engage with them on all the process of natural dye. Next, please. And then the students are actually going, bring back those yarns and they be able to weave, they be able to work on projects. <clears throat> So that was a really uh, rewarding experience. Next, please. And I uh, listed a, here many list of uh, um, the collaborative, you know, partners here uh, within Philadelphia and United States, but also globally uh, engaged with. And next, please. So locally in Philadelphia, I was really connected with the Craft Now Philadelphia, and uh, we launched almost ten years ago. And I've been in part of a, a program committee for working with this really uh, wonderful um, leaders who really promote and advocate about crafts and crafts future, crafts education. And so this was really a really amazing experience of working with them. Next, please. And every year, our students also participate in this uh, types of uh, uh, month of uh, crafts in November. Um, next, please. Next, please. And teach young children be able to engage with the, the material process and textile. Next, please. And also past 15 years, uh, I've been, you know, working with International Opera Theater uh, since 2004 uh, when I arrived to University of the Arts. Next, please. I developed a collaboration with them for, you know, working on sets and uh, um, props and costumes. Next, please. So the theater was uh, uh, located in Città de la Pieve in Umbria, uh, two hours north of Rome. And every year, uh, International Opera Theater premiere projects, particularly in Shakespeare series. Um, I premiered the six projects with them since 2004 uh, up to 2019. Next, please, right before pandemic. So this is early uh, my work with the students uh, working on the set project. And uh, we worked uh, actually on New Arts campus working with the uh, backdrops. Next, please. Uh, there was a Tempest project. And uh, this is a project that actually worked on the, um, uh, it was the next, pro next slide, please. So, it, this is the Buffalo Soldier project that I was working uh, in 2011. Next, please. And I think a slide was a little bit mixed, everyone. So this is actually backdrop from earlier. Next, please. It was a quite challenging entire summer working with the students, but uh, really discovering material, discovering uh, you know how that actual material could expand into the space and the uh, opera format, and also working on the costumes. And also the director, Karen Sion, was very interested in not a traditional types of uh, material or uh, patterns for costumes. And so it was really exciting way that uh, our students and myself would be able to expand uh, what things we could challenge you know, in the, the stage. Next, please. So this is the, uh, one of the recent projects that I worked on. Uh, it's uh, Opera Shim Chung, one of the first Korean, Korean uh, story premiered in Italian. Next, please. So that was right before pandemic, uh, you know, bring the traditional uh, Korean uh, costumes and involve into the Western style of materials. Next, please. Next, please. So in a way, it was really uh, exciting to, to challenge and uh, uh, address things that, that usually, um, I, I, which I don't do it in my studio time. 
this is a project that I was really able to understand uh, the full narratives and music and the uh, movements and a voice. Um, many things I think it was really exciting to work with. Next, please. As a Korean American, I deeply connected to uh, also Korean institutions, educational, cultural, and uh, you know artistic institutions. And many collaborations also happened past uh, 15 years. And one is a uh, uh, Yang um, Embroidery Museum, and also Sungmyung Women University, who has a main, which has a, a really amazing uh, textile collections. And so our students actually learn about the archives and then be able to respond to it, their research and respond to those objects and be able to work on it. So this was a really exciting uh, project that we did in 2016. Next, please. And then I've been also engaged with the Hamburg Advancement Center, which is under actually Ministry of the Sports, Culture, Tourism of Korea. Uh, I met uh, amazing masters of uh, Hamburg designers and makers and business people and historians. And uh, um, we've been collaborated quite a long time since 2000, also 16. I also been collaborating with the MICA um, and also Drexel University, not only specific uni University of the Arts, but many other institutions we've been collaborating and working with the, those masters. So this is a, one of the highlights uh, you know, that happened in 2017, working with the, um, the masters and exhibitions in the student runway show. Next, please. And most recent in November, just last year, two masters who I've been working quite a long time, they came here to JMU and actually exhibiting uh, this beautiful uh, 48 you know, objects and costumes uh, at the museum. Next, please. Next, please. And then these two masters were here for uh, just 10 days intense uh, you know, workshop and uh, uh, classes, and these are the scene of classroom. Next, please. And then every single students were able to complete the, the female costume, uh, you know, shima, which is uh, the skirts and then the jacket on the top. And you can see even male students also completed and they're wearing it. It was really a rewarding experience. Next, please. And then in 2017, I was visiting China as a visiting professor for a uh, professor. And uh, I also visited a Tsinghua University in Beijing. And I've been really connected to many colleagues uh, in China who are um, you know, leaders of fibers and textile medium. Next, please. In 2018, I was invited to um, international um, Asian to Lausanne Fiber Art Biennale, which was amazing. This is actually um, the art museum at Tsinghua University. Next, please. And then this is also, we have a, a art forum happened uh, the following uh, two years later. Next, please. That particular event was a very uh, interesting to see since, uh, you know, a lot of art particularly textile arts coming from Europe and U United States and influenced Asia. And now I saw so much energy uh, in China having leading those, uh, the contemporary fiber art scene. And uh, there was a lots of discussions and lectures and many exhibitions. I'm also currently having a tour exhibition in China with a larger scale artwork. Next, please. So being in that particular, um, Beijing to Lausanne, you know, international fiber art event, I was really connected to uh, many interesting, um, you know, artist organizations in fibers. And the one was World Textile Biennale uh, in Madrid. So it was really um, wonderful to see even what happened in Europe and South America. Next slide, please. And there's a many organizations of, you know, leading fiber organization, fiber art related. Uh, but this particular organizations, they are really well connected, and I was really impressed by um, you know the energy uh, there. Next, please. And also, I met the center gentleman, uh, Professor Churchill Park, who is actually uh, now the director uh, of a Desan Art Museum, and uh, he 
actually converted this uh, museum from ramen factory. Next slide, please. And this particular location of Desan Art Museum is uh, uh, outside of Changwon City in South Korea. It's a very rural uh, farmland. Next, please. But he really uh, transformed this amazing ramen factory into really beautiful, uh, you know, small scale private art museum. And he's also a fiber artist, and he has been, uh, you know, doing a lot of art, cultural, educational projects in their museum. And I got involved a uh, number of exhibitions with them. Next, please. We visited the past May. Next, please. Next, please. And also last year, um, I curated the exhibition of the 2023 International Fiber Art Festival, collaboration with the uh, two amazing women. Left is a daughter. Uh, she's a president of this organization, uh, Jie Shin. And then right, Professor Ham, who's actually mother of a Professor Shin. And uh, they are the founder of this particular organization, leading it for past over 10 years. And uh, they started as a very small group of, uh, you know, fiber artists in South Korea, but it grew into a little much more, you know, international. And they're really interested in uh, working with the, you know, international artists. Next, please. So this is uh, at the Design Museum in Seoul that you know, we collected over 30 artists, uh, Korean, um, Japanese, and Chinese, and you know, European, and uh, United States artists. Next, please. Everyone has a booth. This is Annette Cohenberg exhibition at the right, at the um, leftist side of uh, entrance. Next, please. And uh, this is a Wu Fen professor from China. She presents a body of work. Next, please. This is Rob Mertens from JMU. Next, please. So my main interest for this particular uh, organizations is that to how we can really, um, you know, introduce our young uh, future generations. And these are all our uh, MFA students who are also exhibiting. Next, please. This is uh, their booth. Next, please. So one of the highlight was, uh, you know, my former student Kelly Zoba uh, working on this uh, beautiful work with the, you know, beats commercial, um, commercial beats and uh, constructing this work. It was a really impressive work to see her growth in the particular this exhibition. And so um, it's been really amazing to looking back, uh, you know, thirty years of being in the United States, but for past over 15 years, uh, I've been really interested in continue, interested in connecting with organizations and be able to work with them, how things uh, I'd be able to offer, how I'd be able to influence not only uh, my work, but also others. Next, please. So next segment is the, um, my recent exhibition at the Princeton University Art Museum, Art Bainbridge. The title is a threading memories. Next, please. So this particular um, curator, Zoe Kwok, invited me to have an exhibition two years ago. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, large scales of my works are all exhibiting currently in China. We talked about this particular uh, Art in Bainbridge exhibition site, which is um, which composed with the four intimate rooms and uh, brings you know, 15 years of body of work that could have uh, more meaningful and reflected my uh, you know, research and the practice. Next, please. I've been very interested in um, the material and process driven, particularly working with uh, you know, twist ties and um, you know, zip ties many mundane objects and recent 15 years, I mean, past 15 years of works are, uh, you know, just to really bring the connectivity and time, simple knots or, uh, you know, binding and very much fundamental textile process in a way, um, you know, transform those material to um, the natural, you know, art form. Next, please. 
it almost kind of uh, small little knots to to connect and connect and become some sort of like a web in a way. And I really, um, in, I was interested in how those organic forms also constructed with uh, this kind of mundane objects and uh, the objects that kind of, you know, calculates it, the measures. And so I think I love to bring those, uh, you know, symbiotic relationship with the nature versus, um, artificial materials and uh, how those, you know, bring it, those things, you know, together. Next, please. And then the narratives, how the form exists uh, by those, uh, like, a, like a nothingless and meaningless kind of objects and become shaping something that kind of more organic and be able to bring a life. Next, please. So these are some bubble series that I've been working past 10 years. And this is one of the first bubble uh, series of work that this is actually uh, constructed with a pipe cleaner. Next, please. Next, please. And this is inspirational image of Eleanor Tani, you know, teaching 19 years of textile uh, at UArts. Um, the thread, the teaching weaving was a, one of the way that I really felt profoundly connected to the medium. And I don't really consider myself as a weaver, but I really did love teaching weaving and how those, um, the sensuality on the thread and measuring, just like a beautiful organic, you know, way of connecting the process, the, the measures, and then it becomes some sort of concrete way of uh, the bonding and connecting. And it was really, uh, inspiring having Leonardo Tani always as a kind of leading um, the textile and fibers field, you know, for 50 years. And next, please. And I thought a lot about those uh, moments of threads, you know, the teaching weaving, how those, the, the lines of a, the threads and organize it and then the moment of a chaos. And so I really wanted to bring um, that life cycle of the organization and the, um, the chaos through this uh, thread drawing series. And so these are all unraveled um, spools of uh, you know, sewing threads. Next, please. And you can see the details. And there's also order by the chaos. Next, please. And then the connectivity. And there's a the beautiful moment of those lines and uh, how those little moments that we connect. And I really love that um, the fundamental process of you know, textile that be able to, to kind of uh, transfer that way. And that this is actually work on paper, um, small little needle and thread. I just made a little holes go by uh, the one by one and just really connect those individual holes with the thread and filling in. Next, please. And it could be organic uh, drawing forms and uh, lines. Um, I love to kind of really uh, integrate it in connecting with the, the moments that I feel connected to it. Next, please. And this is a, probably one of the last uh, artwork uh, before my drawing. And this particular exhibition was uh, soft sculptures and uh, um, the mixed media and embroidery and drawings. But uh, this is actually kind of one of uh, my most recent embroidery work, uh, the 20 stack of circular ganza and uh, the gold thread that I, uh, you know, just stitch on those each layers of uh, that uh, each layers of fabric, and then the the drawing those are circles with the, um, the the thread. Next, please. And this is a kind of a continuous of uh, your ideas, and I always love to draw. And in that exhibition, there's a numbers of drawings in it, and. Um, it's always a kind of, you know, uh, sketch and paper, um, a paper on sketch. I think that's really uh, important that I just uh, dreaming and what things could come next. And I hope that someday, you know, this could come out uh, in my reality as a work. Next, please. 
So looking back for 30 years, um, you know, last year, I really felt that uh, very strange moments as a maker, uh, many mentors getting older and uh, also um, passing away. And my father passed away also two years ago. Um, I thought a lot about where I'm heading and where I'm coming from. Next, please. And I think that was a moment where um, I thought a lot about uh, the, the home country that I left. Next, please. This is where I was growing up, uh, Busan, South Korea. Next, please. My childhood memories, I spend all the time in this island, the Kaze Island. I was born there, my grandparents, uh, mostly there, and I spend uh, so much time with the nature. Next, please. And this is a only probably, you know, uh, island and the Busan are not occupied by Korean War, and the nature is quite thick, uh, you know, compared to other parts of Korea, not burned down many places. Next, please. And I think the really nature was an important uh, element and always wanted to be and always inspiring. Next, please. Next, please. So those many, many uh, images are coming from nature and then also the spirit. Uh, my grandmother, who showed me that the, the intensive labor, intensity of the beauty of the crafts, intense, intensity of uh, um, the involvement, engagement of a making. And she was always there. And um, it was amazing to watch her primitive life in 70s when I was growing up. Um, so she was really inspiring. Next, please. And my grandmother, who was a weaver, uh, she was a farmer. She was, a, uh, you know, be able to do anything in household. Next, please. And so I think that was a really uh, quite strong moment of uh, really looking back and also my family, uh, you know, raising children. Uh, going through that, that experience was a quite um, inspiring and, uh, you know, I'd be able to always assess myself. And so it was really um, meaningful. To, to reflecting it, uh, the family and where I was coming from. Next, please. And then the spirituality. And, you know, coming from a very strong Buddhist family and now, you know, um, going to church here, uh, just really kind of a bring those, um, the cultures that I raised and then I adopted here and what that means. Uh, I'm still praying as a person, praying as a maker, praying as an educator. Um, I'm looking for the future, but it's, it's really, these are the, the amazing resources that I have. And I think that these are grounded uh, for my artwork. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Thank you, Miki Young. And we do have some questions here. Don, I'm coming back. Um, that was wonderful. It's really interesting how you started out really with um, this sense of some sense of universality that you're connecting with students and then with this wider world. And then you ended again with this, uh, what to me felt like um, sort of again, reaching out to a universality of generations, you know, that, that through the generations, that's, that's inspiring you. We do have um, some questions. Um, the first of which is from Stacy, who wanted to know if um, the list of, of the collaborative groups that you worked with as a, mm -hmm. you know, the list of resources, whether or not that would be posted. And I think it's possible that that can be sent out with the email that talks about um, the recording of this event. So we'll, uh, maybe Lucy could take a note that um, that we would like to put as you know the SDA would like to include that in our in the email. Yeah, um, I'd be happy to share. That'd be great. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's impressive. It's impressive the extent to which you're connected around the world. It's really wonderful to see. I, I apologize for some technical problems at the beginning. <laughs> Oh, that's not, that is certainly not your fault. <laughs> so, um, and those things happen. And my, my motto is always, let's just make mistakes gracefully in public. 
Okay, so don't worry about it. <laughs> we did fine. So Christy has a question too. Christy is interested in whether or not people, and if so, where you can purchase your work. So are you represented by anyone? Yes. Yes, actually, it used to be Snyderman Works Gallery, amazing, uh, you know, colleague, uh, Rick and Ruth Snyderman, but they retired. So you can contact me directly. Okay. Them to have, you know, just a contact. That's great. Thank you. Um, and then um, Ruth is asking, were you in, in Ruth, I, I think it's Guinness Law, was, I was asking, are you influenced at all by Ruth Azawa? Oh, definitely. Uh, Ruth Osawa and, uh, you know, also Eva Hess, to be honest, um, you know, when I was studying fibers in undergrad program, I was struck by Magdalena Bakanowitz, and I think that her uh, earlier tapestry works, I think, strongly influenced my earlier work, but more and more, I think that my uh, sensibility, I really felt connected to Eva Hess and uh, Ruth Osawa. Uh, just the past this, uh, November, I visited a, um, a Whitney Museum to see, uh, I mean, I saw Ruth Lozawa exhibition many times, but it was so beautiful to see her drawings and watercolors and, you know, many other forms. And, um, you know, she's just really inspiring. Yeah, and I, I do like the way that your practice is diverse as well in that way. That there's small work, there's large work, there's drawings, there's 2D work, there's three-dimensional work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. So we have another question from Catherine, which is, how were you able to keep the pink throne piece together? So it's a technical question. Does it oh, stick okay. together? So many people ask me that question, even at the exhibition site. Um, so that smaller scale, it's all on the wall, but actually the behind it, there's organza, sickle organza. So the threads were all laid down. And when, when I actually unraveled, it was about almost like a two, three inches thick. And then it gradually sized each other. And so you don't really need smaller scale, but still I need a little bit of stitch there to mm -hmm. work on it. Um, I made a, a few larger scale. One is a collection at the Arizona State University Museum, um, the yellow one, but that no, um, no thread or anything to stitch. It was just to kind of lay out as, as it is. And it stays, it stays in this. Right. You know, but then the right, vertical, you have to have some sort of stitches. So the pink one, I did have a little spiral follow through very random stitches in it. Mm. I do love the, I love the idea of using this surface, mm -hmm. not, not just this surface, but this surface engaging the flat. Um, so then I, there's another question from Sally about what kinds of thread you use for the paperwork. Oh, I use as just a regular sewing thread. Yes, great. Okay. And Lois is wondering when, with the red pipe cleaner bubble, did you start with sketching or did you just start Improvis imp improvising as you were? So usually, always, I think in a way, I do have drawing first. Any other small or larger pieces, I do have the sketches as a, some sort of guidance. And then while I'm constructing it, it could kind of go evolve slightly differently, but um, I, I did have some guidance. Great, all right. And we have Kim Ling who is wondering um, about the duality of your background. Mm -hmm. And um, did you have any part of your life where you felt disconnected from your Korean roots? Mm -hmm. um, I, I never felt disconnect. Uh, it's always a connections there, but it's, a, it, it's, you know, I've been here 30 years, but there's a different time period of whether you, how much you connected, you know, how much you disconnect, but, um, I always felt at the beginning of maybe five, 10 years, I feel like a little sandwiched. It's like in between. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had a moment in 2011, I invited a uh, Kai Chen, amazing also textile artist from Canada. So he lived in Canada for uh, 37 years. And then he kind of really hit my head with uh, you know, my, my uh, question about being in between. And I think it's it's a perspective in a way. Now I don't see it as a you know I'm in between, I'm both, and mm -hmm. I think that that really allow me to more possibilities and uh, also um, the benefits 
and allow me to observe what I have. And I think that that was a um, good way to kind of approach. Um, either way, I'm so rooted strongly from the Korean aesthetic, culture, the language, food, you know, you can name it. Um, mm -hmm. But here, there's just so much to learn. And, uh, um, and constantly, I feel like I'm just trying to kind of catch up. But I think art really uh, made me to kind of observing in a really best way, um, you know, it's kind of grounded me as a, um, as a person. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a little bit, she asks again, um, one of the other things she asks is um, kind of what you're talking about now, which is what is, what is the effect that has on your art? Um, mm -hmm. She wondered if, if the duality affected what you're making. Is there a direct link, do you think, in terms of you know, you know, your roots and the juggle? I think so, definitely. Um, so even I think that you know, the viewing it, um, not so much as it analyzing it, but in a way, even finding the material, for example, I think that was uh, particularly my time in growing up Korea, 70s and 80s. It was very, I mean, also the country is so small. It's like a size of a Michigan, very limited a resource. We're here massively large. And so everything had to be um, kind of still very much safe. And uh, we don't really have a lot of goods to use. Where I came here in early 90, uh, I was really shocked by like a large mega stores where there's just so much commodity there. Um, so how those things embedded in my work and, and, and how I do it. And I think that, that was always a kind of interesting question to ask mm -hmm. myself and address it. Yeah, one of the questions I would have too is, you know, sometimes you're using, you know, plastic and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. We, we, I feel like we, this culture depends on plastic for so many things, medical devices, mm -hmm. containers and so forth. And I wondered if your use of the, of the zip ties and plastic, if you were thinking at all about the, you know, the overuse of plastic and mm -hmm. um, that tension be, between this beautiful thing that you can make out of plastic mm -hmm. and the, right. like, the plastic that's ruining our world. Mm -hmm. um, so Deborah Price is also asking, um, can you estimate how long it takes for you to make one of the organic sculptures hanging pieces? So it depends on like, uh, you know, usually I constructed a lot of larger pieces during the summer. And uh, if I can exclusively work in, you know, a couple of hours per day, every day, that types of larger pieces, uh, it depending on the material, but I can uh, do with really maybe two, three months. Two or three months, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you work on more than one at once? Usually I do both when it was, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then Martha is asking, um, she's stating first that she loved seeing the rope spiral background in the theater and wondering mm -hmm. how you instruct the students to create that piece. Did you teach them a weave or was it random joining? And I would like to add to that my question to you, which is how do you juggle in that collaborative work with students um, mm -hmm. or vision of mm -hmm. what? you know, of what you're expressing, um, and then their abilities and their vision. So, mm -hmm. you know, right, right. she's asking a how-to, and I'm asking you how you juggle, too. So that's a really good question. Um, so particularly early, the very first uh, question about the deck construction, uh, you know, I have to show the, the drawing, and I have to show them, um, you know, yeah. samples. And then there's a different kinds of uh, the like a stage to address that types of work. Mm -hmm. um, for the, your second question, it, it's it's uh, a uh, quite an organizational you know skill that requires and management skills. Uh, working with the the collaborator itself, you know the director and her vision, and then I have to add my vision. And when you teach to the students, it actually it different layers. So it, it's a quite intense uh, summer work. Um, but if you're really clear on what you do, but also you really have to have the flexibility. And sometimes what you planned is not always going to the best way. Um, so that kinds of a, a balance between, then I think it's always kind of, you know, uh, fine. But particularly students, what I did um, past three projects was that giving very particular interest of assignments. And so they can have one student is really, you know, interested in dying, and that could be a dying process. 
and some are interested in kind of construction process we constructed. And so there's a way that dividing uh, some sort of you know, assignments, dividing times, and it's almost like running a company in a way. And so those are kind of requires a lot of a, a head of students you know, on the projects to be able to communicate those. But, but at the same time, I think always, uh, you know, like a big studio, you're working all together, you just have to kind of go by float, you know, have a good experience. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that there's a certain amount of skill building that you have to sort of train, teach, train, certain yes. skill, and then, exactly. and then people are going to find they're good with their hands, or they're better with a tool, or, you know, they're going to find what they're, they're going to decide whether or not they want to do the dyeing, or they want to right. do the exactly. Right, depending. Um, and I, I do think some of the textile practices are incredibly um, sort of calming and therapeutic for kids that mm -hmm. are in, in college and have quite a bit of pressure on them to perform. So mm -hmm. these repetitive tying or binding or um, knitting or stitching can be, you know, not a really nice thing to go along with your college mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would say one of the other things that I noticed that I really loved were the reference to traditional Korean uh, dress and, mm -hmm. and garment making and so forth. And um, I wondered if, um, if, you, if you could share what you feel the students, um, how did they feel about their skirts when they finished their skirts, for instance? What do you think students gained from that experience mm -hmm. that they wouldn't have gained if it had stayed within the continental United States garment right. making? What, what, what does bringing that give the students? So multiple different things, uh, you know, particularly when I first kind of connected to Hanbok Advanced Center and Hanbok Masters was in my, my own curiosity and then invited from the, um, you know, International Opera Theater about this Korean project that we had to construct it. And so that was initiative of thoughts. But also um, the garment itself, you know, many of uh, the Western garments, how they constructed and the Eastern garment, particularly the Koreans and Japanese, um, they're like really like a kimono, for example, it's very much square, it's very flat. And so it's a different types of uh, the pattern making. So I think that's like a little bit more, uh, you know, sort of fundamental things that maybe students are interested in. But I think the mostly uh, cultural, the students are very interested in what those different experiences about this kind of empire style and then learning about how those, uh, you know, culture of uh, the, uh, I mean, the history of a Hanbok changed, what kinds of influence. Um, so I think that there's a really kind of uh, interesting to way, you know, connecting the, the culture. So that was, I think, really uh, the taking away from students and, you know, be able to also go the details, measuring um, what the importance of the highlights and the costume different from the Western style. I, I think too that the concept of masters mm -hmm. is something that we could benefit from being exposed mm -hmm. to here. You know, the right. fact that there are masters that are respected and um, we, you know, we don't necessarily have that word, use that word necessarily in the same mm -hmm. way. Um, we don't, it's not a category of a person, mm -hmm. a craft person or a maker, or an artist that's gotten to a certain point in their career. And I really love that idea of the kids being exposed to, mm -hmm. you know, to masters. In terms of you were saying that, you know, at first it was really your interest. And um, when you uh, when, when you went and looked at all the historic garments and you came back and you created, continued creating your work, can you see a, a through line? Can you see um, a way that you were influenced by historic things? And can you point to that in your work or or? I think so. And I think that, um, you know, particularly embroidery, you know, uh, I've been seeing the, I've been seeing my mother when she got married, what she brought to, you know, uh, to the, my father's family, there's a beautiful, you know, embroidered work and uh, um, the Korean traditional household, we didn't really have lots of furniture, many things are kind of like uh, tying it or cover with the, you know, fabrics in the past. Um, so the cloth was very important. And that types of uh, um, the embroidered, I think that was really uh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that too. I, I, 
I, I am seeing that we have more questions from, the, from um, participants. And Karen is wondering, what support system do you use for your large 3D works? Is there wire? So that so, they can right. So uh, actually, because it's a little bit thin wires inside of the um, twist ties and pipe cleaners, and so it was easy to construct it. And uh, the funny story was, actually, when I started the bubble, um, the you know bubble sculpture in two thousand eight, I wanted to construct it with something else, but it failed miserably. And I worked with a you know uh, was a fishing line monofilament. I dyed a beautiful red, but it, for a month it didn't really go anywhere. So the show was approaching, I just had a no time. And so I really had to discover the pipe cleaner. Um, so that's how I kind of landed with the pipe cleaner. Yeah, another um, anonymous attendee is asking for those big hanging pieces, um, do you start them in the hanging position or do you start them flat and then? Yeah, them that, that's a good question. I start from the bottom to construct it on the top. Uh, at the last one, you know, I had to kind of hang them to kind of, you know, construct it together. Mm -hmm. You did. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the young, uh, there's, this is from Anne, who's asking um, young people in the photo uh, in their hand box, am I mm -hmm. saying, did they stay with the traditional design or did anyone change, add, or embellish these ceremonial outfits? So this one was very much fundamental course for Hamburg. So we didn't really have um, improvisations or anything. It was just kind of really learning basic pattern. Even though it's a basic, those two masters were teaching slightly differently. We had a two different group. You can't see it in the probably picture, um, but there's some different ways that they, they made the jackets and dresses and how they approach us very different. I mean, not very different, but there are different ways of approaching. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have, um, I have a couple more questions. Um, we, one is another an anonymous attendee who is saying, what is next for you? Is it similar explorations or a different path? That's good questions too. Um, so I didn't share here with my uh, video here. Um, I'm also interested in somehow, you know, film work in the future. Um, I'm going to continue to work uh, on the piece that I'm working on, it, but um, I am interested in, you know, the drawing thread series continuously and where it's going to lead it into. Um, so still like a discovering period. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is linked to another question from Karina, who is asking, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you go from idea process? Mm -hmm and the final piece. So, you know, what moves you to start? Mm -hmm. And then does it, you know, does it, does it go through a journey mm -hmm. before it's finished? Yes, uh, I mean, I think that each artist maybe approaches differently. For me, um, the, the starting point is like a various, sometimes inspired by, you know, previous work or inspired by um, the certain colors or any kind of images. So always, I think of gathering sketches. The sketch is always what I do daily, you know, 15 minutes, you always kind of, it's like almost like you're journaling, keep drawing, and then looking back what things could be possible. And I try to maybe engage with the material uh, and then addressing it. But the um, little more clarity is that the, the, particularly I made a really larger pieces, everyone. Um, some are like, you know, 40 feet, 22 feet, 15 feet. Those are really large. Those works uh, are very clear what I'm going to accomplish. I know the material, I know the image. Uh, sometimes I'm just gonna really have a very clear idea and then I'm just working on it very focused. And so, um, so once that guideline of uh, drawings and sketches and knowing the material, I'd be able to kind of really complete it very easy. Uh, I repeatedly talk to everyone that oftentimes smaller works are the hardest, the difficult one, because it counts every single details, where the larger work is actually forgiven. And so you can see those larger pieces I constructed when my kids are very small. 
because I couldn't really think of anything else. It just, uh, it's a physically demanding, but um, in terms of, uh, you know, construction, I can just kind of straight move forward where the smaller pieces, the problem is that the, you have to be extremely conscious about your decision-making like a jeweler, you know, all the little details. And so sometimes I avoided when uh, I was raising my children when they were really young. Um, so I think now I can have a little more room to be able to actually, um, you know, work on the embroidered pieces. Mm. I hope that makes sense. Yes, it does. It does make sense. Um, I think we have about uh, a minute, maybe a minute and a half left. And a question I have for you, because you're so well-traveled and have so many connections. Are you seeing any trends in the fiber art or textile world that are interesting to you that, you know, that you find, you know, different or, um, mm. or just consistently you're seeing it and it's kind of interesting? Um, you know, what I see continuously is that uh, the energy of a community, the connectivity. I mean, what uh, Surf Design Association does and uh, what all the organization that I met, uh, I'm also connecting with the, um, the Crafts Council in Ukraine and Textile Associations there too. But, you know, each organization of, uh, particularly I feel like a textile related, um, very similar people, to be honest with you. They're warm, kind, they're organic, you know, they love, you know, fuzzy things and thread things. and things that we can be able to, you know, work with um, comfortably. And it, so each country has its merits, but it's it's become more kind of universal, to be honest. And uh, when I visited China, uh, there's a strong movements about the, the embroidery, like a machine embroidery. Mm -hmm. And I think that they have even factory that actually the many artists are um, the designers. And then they send their design to the factory to construct large scale embroidery. So there's some types of things that are slightly different, but overall, I felt that um, the community of the textile are just so amazing, uniquely connected, supportive community. Great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mi Young Lee. That was wonderful and so informative. And I really enjoyed everything that you shared today. Thank you to our sponsors as well. And today's recording will be available on YouTube in the next week. And next Wednesday, January 24th, the textile talk will be World War I Quilts, the Sue Wright Collection presented by the International Quilt Museum. Thank you, everyone who came today and great questions from the participants. Thank you, Mi Young Young. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good to see you.